I've come up with a categorization system for dishonorable speech. Why? Because dishonorable speech causes real damages in the world, whether people notice the damages or not. And I believe it could be helpful in avoiding future destruction to be precise in calling out dishonorable speech and its associated damages. So I've come up with 37 categories of dishonorable speech. This is not what's known as a minimal set, meaning that some categories overlap or are subcategories of other categories. I've purposely put some subcategories as their own categories to draw attention to these mechanisms of dishonorable speech. For instance, offering opinion as fact, category number 13, is a subset of misrepresenting how things are in reality, category number 11. It's misrepresenting opinions as facts. I've generally organized the categories in groups with similar damages, wherein the early categories tend to destroy value by limiting people's options, while the later categories may promote stealing, cheating, lying, violence, destruction, injustice, and directly promote hate. There is some overlap of damages between categories, of course. And before I get into my list of 37 categories, I should mention that if you haven't seen it yet, you may want to watch my YouTube video or go to my dishonorablespeechinpolitics.com website for how I define dishonorable speech. Now, in the damages I give for each category of dishonorable speech, I'll often mention options. Generally, more options as for getting and giving experiences and avoiding death mean more value at least in the hands of primarily love-motivated people. And this relates directly to my definition of dishonorable speech. For this first of four videos, I'll cover category numbers one through six. The first category of dishonorable speech on my list of 37 categories is name-calling and insults, such as calling someone a jerk or stupid or ugly or even a monster. The damages of this type of speech are that it limits the options of the person about whom the dishonor was spoken by changing how people think about them it also limits people's options, firstly, in how they can think about the person who is the subject of the dishonor, and secondly, by presenting the possibility that the same fate of being insulted could befall them. In addition, it supports the non-reality-based idea that people are what they do, or they are their attributes. It can also support that once someone has done bad things, or even been thought to have done bad things, they deserve to be disrespected and treated as less than human. Instead of challenging someone's ideas or destructive words and actions, name-calling and insults are an ad hominem attack on someone's personhood, distracting away from the actual issues at hand. This category has three levels. Number one, generally the least damaging. Insults to attributes such as attractiveness, intelligence, etc. Number two, insults that imply or state that they're a bad person. And number three, generally the most damaging of the three, Insults that imply they're evil or inhuman, such as calling someone a monster. I say generally the most and least damaging because someone might not care that you call them evil, and they and most others don't see any basis for calling them that, while if you call them stupid, perhaps that's the thing they're most insecure about. So the resulting damages do depend on the specific situation. The second category of dishonorable speech, guilt by association, is a major issue in today's society, I believe. Guilt by association seems to feed in with cancel culture, whereby if someone has ever been accused of doing something bad, if you don't condemn them as a bad person and destroy any t-shirts or other promotional materials associated with them, you're a bad person and should be shunned by all. The damages of the guilt by association type of dishonorable speech include that the person may not be guilty of anything bad, but their options become limited if people believe that they are somehow bad based on this logical fallacy. Just because they don't condemn the person they're associated with who allegedly has done bad, this does not mean they agree with or support the alleged bad behavior. It could be that they have some level of doubt about the allegations. It's very damaging, in my opinion, when a mass of people declare case closed and then demand that everyone else agree with no doubt allowed. This category has two levels, the first being that the person or organization being associated with has been portrayed as bad, while the second is when they're portrayed as evil. The third category is shaming, which is a form of dishonorable speech that implies that if you don't feel shame for your alleged bad actions, you're a bad person. Damages can include promoting someone's morality as the ultimate one, limiting options by making critical thinking on morality less likely. It also limits the options of the person about whom the dishonor was spoken by changing how people think about them. An example might be, he should be ashamed of himself for eating the last cookie. This category has only one level. The fourth category is implied incompetence or wrongdoing. Examples might be, the murder happened at 7 p.m. No one knows where John was at 7 p.m. 
or that company lost a ton of money and he did work in management there for 20 years. This is three levels, implying incompetence, implying dishonesty or stealing, and implying violence. The damages of this category are similar to that of the first category, name calling and insults. The fifth category is accusing someone of wrongdoing without supporting data. An example would be claiming fraud by election workers without having hard evidence to back this up. This category has two levels, accusations of dishonesty or stealing and accusations of violence. It has similar damages to the first and fourth categories, and like those categories, it can be difficult to defend against this type of dishonorable speech since no hard data has been presented that one could try to refute. The sixth category, and the final one I'm going to talk about in this video, is saying you're frustrated with or scared of someone, or having some other negative emotional reaction to someone, implying they're bad or have done wrong. It has two levels, implying they're bad and implying they're evil. An example would be, I've never been so angry in my life after what he said to me last night. The damages include limiting the options of the person about whom the dishonor was spoken by changing how people think about them, and it also damages the person who speaks with dishonor because the person who they're speaking to now may feel like they have to watch what they say and do around this person, or they might get angry and tell people about this just like they've done with them. We often feel that our anger is justified, and so we may believe that others' anger is justified in some way as well. But someone being angry with how someone else has spoken or acted does not mean that person's speech or actions were bad or that they are a bad person. I hope you found this video useful for identifying some of the different categories of dishonorable speech and what some of their damages are. If you did, please like this video. Also, please subscribe to my channel if you want to see the upcoming three videos talking about the remaining 31 of my dishonorable speech categories. Thanks for watching.